is my colleague Laura Cox, who's another advisory board member, who's just going to give you a, a rundown introduction to, of the workshops. Hi, um, hello everyone. Could I invite the, each uh, member of the workshop team who are going to do their little lightning pitches to come up to the stage, please? Um, okay. Right. Information about the uh, workshops and the facilitators is in the conference program. Um, the workshops are happening next. Um, that helps. Um, and so what we're going to do is everybody's going to have an opportunity to do like two minute little lightning pitch, tell you a little bit about the workshop so that you've got more context for when we do the feedback session later on. Um, so I'm going to invite Ros Pine to come and tell you all about OA Books. Good morning, everyone. Um, apologies for the slightly croaky voice. Um, so I'm Roz. I work on open access books at Springer Nature. Um, in the first workshop, which I am co-running with Valerie McCutcheon of Glasgow and Mr. Lukov from also from Springer Nature, we are looking at how can we increase open access for books and chapters, and we'll be looking at what some of the challenges and opportunities are. If we are to help make the vital research that is done in the humanities and the social sciences freely available and reusable to all, we have to figure out how to make open access work for books and how to make it scalable. We're seeing increasing attention from European funders. UKRI have indicated that they will introduce some kind of monograph mandate for the next REF, which is very rapidly approaching from a publications point of view. Coalition also S also tell us that the transition for OA for monographs should be as short as possible. Most major humanities and social and science publishers now offer an open access books option. We've seen a number of really exciting developments from new university and library led presses focusing on open access books. But we're still seeing only a tiny proportion of OA books published OA and significant challenges remain. They include funding, the appropriateness of existing open access models developed for journals, for books, um, licensing, disciplinary differences, the sheer variety of book formats and cultural issues. So please join me and my co-facilitators for a highly interactive workshop to pick through some of those issues and help plan a bright future for open access books. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, now if I could invite Mario Malecki to uh, come up and talk about workshop B on automating workflows. Hi, and good morning everyone. Um, I think we all know that currently scientific publishing is in the top of the game as Erebus has been. We have more than 160 million publications currently existing. There's more than 3 million publications that are published every year. There's more than 8 million researchers out there and things are going to change a lot. Uh, it is expected that in the next 10 years, huge changes come to scholarly publishing because of the artificial intelligence, robotics and automation of everything, including not just, of course, publishing, but the world itself. So what we're going to do in our three workshops, we're going to talk about 28 currently existing machine learning artificial intelligence systems that exist in scholarly publishing or that have been announced in the last year. Um, and we're going to tackle this a little bit differently than the other workshops. In the first one, in the first session of 50 minutes, we're going to focus on automatic uh, generation of systematic reviews and knowledge synthesis and finding experts for reviewing other papers or grants uh, in projects. The second workshop, we're going to focus on uh, finding um, outreach uh, and outputs, so all the metrics that we're going to do and how we measure them and how we can use them. So it's going to a little bit overlap with the other topics that you see in some um, panels that I'm going to see happening. And in the third workshop as well, we're going to then talk about the visions of the future and how all of this could be integrated into seeing the future and what happens next. If we start using all of this machinery, I think a very interesting question comes in, how will the normal process of science reporting and research be done? So please join us that we see what can be maybe happening in a very near future. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And now Andrea um, Powell will uh, talk about levelling the playing field in Workshop C. Thanks, Laura, and good morning, everyone. So when the UN published its Sustainable Development Goals back in 2015, there was some surprise that there was no specific goal relating to equality of access to information or technical knowledge to drive innovation and development. 
Instead, there's a recognition throughout the SDGs that information is a catalyst for development and not a development outcome in its own right. Equal access to authoritative, relevant information and the development of the capacity to exploit that information underpins all of the SDGs. The agenda also acknowledges that transformational impact can only be achieved at scale if knowledge is effectively communicated and embedded within all aspects of the infrastructure, workflows and policies of national research systems. In many ways, access to research output has never been easier. And initiatives like Research for Life and others have been improving equality of access for well over 15 years now. But researchers in the Global South don't just need to read other people's articles to make progress, they need to participate fully in the scholarly research and communication ecosystem by publishing their own research and developing their own peer networks and information literacy skills. And here lies the challenge. Despite the existence of programs like Research for Life, AuthorAid, INASP and others, research outputs from the Global South remain stubbornly low particularly in comparison to countries like China and India. Why is this? What are the blockers preventing researchers from communicating their own research and becoming part of the global research community, not just passive observers? Does the shift to open access simply replace the barrier to access with a new barrier, this time to publish? We'll be hearing later today from Professor Siva Umapathy and Dr. Hasib Fanula about their experiences of scholarly communication in India and Bangladesh. And both of them have kindly agreed to join us in Workshop C, and we hope you'll also join us to explore these issues further and to identify some practical steps that all the players in the researcher to reader ecosystem can take to level the playing field and improve equality, not just of access to knowledge, but of full participation in the research communication landscape. Thank you, Andrea. And I uh, can introduce Beck Evans, who's going to talk about supporting early career scholarship. Working in academic publishing, I found the most powerful way to create new products and services was to work with the people who were going to be using them, the customers, the researchers, the readers. Um, and that's exactly what we're going to be doing in Workshop D. We're going to take the insight from early career researchers, their own words, the barriers, the problems they face, and then we're going to use that as a trigger to co-create solutions. And so that's why I'm asking for participants to come along with their own experience and expertise and views on this to use and build and create solutions for these scholars. Um, if you fancy it, it's going to be um, for you if you are interested in early career researchers or if you work with them at the moment. If you want to know more about the writing process and the barriers to productivity and getting published. If you enjoy making new products or if you're interested in human-centered design and innovation techniques, it's a really hands-on workshop. It's going to be facilitated by Dee Watchhorn. From, she's head of insight at De Groyter Publishing and Dr. Christine Tully, uh, Professor of English and Master of Rhetoric, and me, I'm Beck Evans, co-founder of Prolif Prolifico, and a writing productivity geek. So we'll see you in Workshop D. Thank you, Beck. And if I could um, introduce Daniel Himmelstein, who will be talking about citation by identifier, Workshop E. Hello. So raise your hand if you love manually reformatting a bibliography for a different journal style. <laughs> uh, <laughs> copying and uh, cutting, you know, author names and rearranging them. Or if you like uh, reading a reference and then Googling short author initials with a year in journal to try to find what paper is actually referenced. <laughs> so this workshop will uh, discuss ways that we can address this problem by adopting citation by persistent identifiers. The vision here is that a scholarly author uh, would cite a work by its persistent identifier, such as a digital object identifier uh, or a PubMed ID, and then all of the additional steps till the paper was published and read were entirely automated, uh, leveraging the power of new databases and persistent identifiers. So uh, join us in Workshop E if that sounds interesting to you. Thank you, Daniel. Okay, just before we head out to the workshops, um, for those of you who expressed a preference in advance, we've tried to fit you with your first choice, 
but it, to ensure balance amongst the different mix of participants, a few of you will have been allocated to your second choice. We've also got different, differing room sizes, so if you didn't pre-select a workshop, could you bear in mind the numbers in the room before you oust someone? Um, the Paget, Anderson, Barnes and uh, Moral rooms are downstairs on the ground floor, and the Worcester and Prince's rooms are on this floor through the council chamber. And we've got some quick maps here, which are also on the back of your programme. Oh, don't know what happened there. Technical failure, sorry, bit, folks. Right, everybody now, please go off to your workshops. <laughs>